All right, Greg, how's it going? Good, how are you? I'm good, I appreciate you taking the time. You know, you've uh, been the, uh, one of the main guys out there. Uh, the murder rap book, could, you know, kind of told the whole story about Tupac and Biggie and everything. And, um, you know, just appreciate you taking the time. My pleasure. Keefe D had said some guy named Marcus took Trayvon's chain? Probably Marcus Hunter. Okay, and so it wasn't um, Orlando that actually took the, was was did the chain actually get taken? Like, did they leave the store with the chain? It really depends on who you're talking to. Of course, this all happens outside, not in the store. It happens outside, and there's you know a, a, a physical confrontation, a fist fight. Uh, the chain either does get taken, and then it's you know it's recovered, or it's taken and not recovered. Depends on who you. Depends on who you talk to. Ah, okay. One thing that I, I recently discovered is uh, when Orlando got jumped, that he got hurt pretty bad. Never saw that. I never you saw know. any information to support that. Oh, okay. There was never a crime report filed from that incident. Obviously, these gangsters don't want to deal with the police, so they all scatter before you know mall security gets law enforcement there, and there's no crime report to document that incident so we don't we don't have all the details other than talking to the people that were involved you know such as uh well there were just people involved that we interviewed that told their side of the story oh okay you know whether it's vegas or in the, at the lakewood mall either of those confrontations orlando was never seriously hurt whatsoever in vegas of course we knew that he had contact with the police and he didn't even want to file a report. He didn't want to take any action. So they kind of just dismissed the whole thing. So clearly he wasn't seriously injured. Otherwise, there would have been medical attention and that type of thing. So at this point, Orlando's, Orlando's been jumped and Kifidi gets word. Somebody lets him know that uh, Orlando's been jumped. And then uh, they go meet up with Zip. Right. And, and what uh, happens with that? According to Keefe D, Zip and some other guys from New York approach him. They say, hey, you know, we got your back on this. You need some help. And Keefe D says, no, got my boys. We'll handle this. And he says, but we have no, you know, we don't have any weapons. And Zip says something to the effect of, I can help you out with that. They go out to the car. Zip gives him a, um, a Glock. And uh, then they go after, you know, on the hunt. Okay. Was anybody else with Zip at the time? Yeah, there was several guys from New York that were with him. Okay. No rappers? Uh, no, not, I, I only know the names of these people, and as far as I know, they were not rappers. There were more guys that were involved in, um, in Zip's circle of friends, people from New York that not, not rappers that I'm aware of. Oh, okay. Uh, that's fair. In his book, he says Fox, a rapper Foxy Brown was with him. Well, she wasn't there during this conversation. When they went out to the car, she was in the car. But during this conversation that took place prior to getting to the car, I don't, I don't think she was present. Uh, so this conversation between Zip, some other New Yorkers are there, Keefe D, Southsiders, and they all kind of evaluating what just, what just took place with Orlando. And then when they go out to the car, Foxy's there according to Keefe D. Okay. In Keefe D's book, he says Big Meech was there. Mm -hmm. But then when people ask him in an interview, he says it's somebody different. Hmm. What, is there, which Big Meech is he talking about? Is he talking about Big Meech from Detroit? Could be. Yeah, it could be. All right. There was a guy from Detroit there. I don't know if he goes by the name Big Meech, and that's why I can't be very definitive about that. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, who all was in the car that night? So you have in the back seat, DeAndre Smith. He's sitting in the left passenger seat. And then uh, you have Orlando on the right. And then in the front seat is Keefe D as a passenger. And then Terrence Brown is driving the Cadillac. Okay. So um, at this point, they've, they've got the gun from Zip. And they've, uh, I believe that they were all in different cars and then they got out and switched. There was two cars. There was a van and then the white Cadillac, which was a rental from, I think, Long Beach Enterprise over by the airport. And Keefe D was originally in the van. But after they kind of had a little bit of 
difference of opinions of whether they should do this. Keefe D gets out of the van and gets into the Cadillac with Terrence, Dre, and Orlando. So there were two cars that originally went over towards the 662. Okay. Okay, so at this point... Now, when Keefe D says Big Meech was there, is he talking about within his circle, of, in, his, in his crew, or with Zip? I believe with him... Because there was a guy from Detroit in both crews. In both crews? Mm -hmm. Okay. I believe he said with him. Mm. Okay. He must have been in the van then. Yeah, I think so. So they, uh, they see Tupac, and now they're, uh, they're pulling up. And at what point does Keefe D give the gun to Orlando? Just prior to actually pulling up, once they see the entourage... Um, going in the opposite direction, they make their U-turn as they're approaching the line of cars. That's when Keefe D hands it to the back seat because he knows that they're going to be on the left side of the vehicle and he's going to have to shoot across the face of DeAndre Smith. Oh, I'm sorry, um, Terrence Brown. Okay. Did he first try to give it to, t to uh, Terrence? Um, no, he first tried to give it to DeAndre Smith, who is in the back seat behind Terrence. Okay. And then what happened? DeAndre Smith was like, nah, I'm, I'm not the one who's going to be doing this. And Orlando just grabbed the gun and proceeded to shoot. Okay. And uh, so then here's where uh, Keefe D says, you know, he see, looked shook in his eyes. And then he says in the book that Tupac reached for a gun or he thought Tupac pulled a gun on him. Mm -hmm. Is there any truth to that? It's ridiculous, and Keefe D knows it's ridiculous, and I think Keefe D is trying to, uh, you know, I, I think he's, he thinks that if he can provide this kind of idea that it's a self-defense situation, somehow that will mitigate his, res not responsibility, but I think that Keefe D believes that if he gives there a possibility of a self-defense claim that should there ever be charges filed, he can make this, you know, this idea that, hey, the guy was pulling a gun on us, and therefore we just, you know, it's just this long after the fact look going, well, if I'm going to admit to this, I better figure out how to make it defensible. Okay. So would, you, would this defense have any, anything in court? Would it the whole story is ridiculous. And, you know, he's waited, he, he had all his opportunities to say that that's what happened with us originally. That would have been the time to tell somebody that, yeah, it was self-defense, you know, Tupac pulled the gun. If he's going to make that claim, it should have been made at the time that we interviewed him. And of course, Tupac wasn't pulling a gun on anybody. He got completely caught off guard. You know? And right. so it's just, it's just Keefe D doing what he does. He keeps switching up his story because he's, you know, trying to figure out how to stay above in front of this whole thing. Okay, all right. Um, and then so after the shots are fired, the Cadillac takes off, and the girls looks like accidentally ended up following them as they were trying to get out of the way of everything. Yeah, the girls are just like trying to get away from the chaos. You know, as the shooting ensues, and they're not sure what's going on. And, uh, you know, they just go into the, they go in the direction that was, seemed like the easiest escape route. So there's nothing like intentional about it. They just have to turn the same way that the Cadillac did. Right, right. And then, and then somebody, uh, somebody else from the death row entourage followed Keefe D too, correct? Yeah, Buntry um, was driving his Celica, his Supra. And uh, um, then he had, what's his name in the car with him? Yeah, uh, the name escapes me right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they followed him, and uh, how, how far did they follow him? A very short distance. You know, once they got around the corner, the Cadillac was taken off. They're receiving fire back in their direction, and so they kind of just back down. Okay. Okay, so um, Keefe D and everybody, they take off. They go park the car, and uh, did they stash the gun? According to him. Where, where did they stash the gun? In the wheel well of the car. Okay, and then uh, they take off walking. 
And he says they seen Tupac and them in the ambulance. Well, an ambulance went by. Obviously, they can't see inside of it, so they're just assuming that that's because the timing would have been consistent with uh, that being Tupac in the ambulance. So, uh, you know, it's their impression that that was the, amb the ambulance, and it probably was. Keefe D mentions in the interview that he, he wanted Orlando and Tupac to fight one-on-one, -on -one, and that's originally what they went to Club 662 for. Again, this is just Keefe D elaborating on the story with the intention of providing some type of mitigation to the responsibility of it all, you know? And he's kind of talked himself into a corner um, when he confessed to begin with. And so now he's trying to do damage control with that. And he lost a lot of face with his crew with Southside after they found out that he had thrown Orlando under the bus and that he, you know, cooperated with law enforcement. And so now these years, he's just constantly trying to figure out a way to juggle it and manage it so that, uh, he doesn't look as bad as he did. So he never mentioned this? No, in the, in of the, course uh, not. That's not the way they take care of business. Come on. You're gonna roll, <laughs> you're gonna roll up to a establishment full of your enemies and walk in after you've just had this fight and say, hey, let's do this the gentleman's way, a one-on-one -on -one fight. Like, right, that's right. just not the way gangsters do business. Do you know if they thought Tupac was dead at the time? Well, you know anything about their conversations afterwards? No, Keefe D told us that he thought Suge was, had been shot in the head. And so his impression was likely, at least in that immediate aftermath, he would have thought that, you know, somebody gets shot in the head. You know, typically that's a mortal wound. So, you know, um, the next day, of course, the reports start coming out on the news about Tupac being in the hospital in critical condition. So they would have known as soon as the reports came out that, that, that he wasn't dead. I don't know what they thought as far as the shooting. Obviously, Orlando laid down some fire. How many times he shot Tupac, he wouldn't have probably known, but he probably would have known that he hit him. Okay, so, um, so at this point, um, they get back. They get back from uh, Vegas, and um, Monday comes around, and Puffy calls, um, I believe, Zip on Monday. And they meet up? Keefe D said the following day. So if the fight was Saturday night, it could have been in the afternoon of Sunday or you know, maybe Monday. Okay. Yeah, and, and can you take me through that? Yeah, he says they're at the wing spot up on Melrose and um, he's with Zip and the phone rings and uh, it's Puffy on the other end of the line. And he asked the question, was that us? Did he say anything? Well, who, Keefe D? Yeah. Talking to Puffy? Yeah, uh, yeah he affirmed it. Yeah, that was us. Okay. In his book, he says, Faith called Zip right before Puffy called. Okay. Is there anything to that? No, except that, you know, Faith understood the dynamics of all of these relationships. You know, Faith knew that, um, that Zip, she was close with Zip, obviously. And when she would come to L.A. and these gangsters would be around, Zip would tell her, you know, these guys are just here kind of, don't worry about them, they're just here as basically security or part of the crew. So it would have been natural for her to draw the conclusion after seeing what, or hearing about what happened in Vegas that it had something to do with that. Okay. So it, she, out of curiosity, may have called and just been like, what the f what's happening? Uh, is there any, any, proof, any proof that Biggie knew anything about no. what was going on? There's none. So people can speculate and maybe he did, maybe he didn't, but we don't have any proof one way or the other. At this point, you know, they're back, and now a war breaks out in Compton. Was there bounties put out on Southside Crips? No, I don't know. I'm not that I'm aware of. I mean, it's just you don't need to put a bounty out there to declare war on your enemies. I mean, this is just natural um, reactions to these type of situations within the gang world. You know, you have somebody assaulted or beaten or shot or whatever, and your crew is involved, well, you're gonna retaliate against the people that you believe did it. You don't have to offer money or, you know, some type of reward for doing what you're supposed to be doing to begin with as, as, a, as a gang member. 
Right, you know right, right. Yeah, I just that's just what <laughs> Keefy said. The sugar, the sugar put a bounty on him, or they they had put a bounty, or somebody had came by and said that there was a bounty on. And these rumors start, and maybe there's some truth to them. We don't know. Um, you know, when Suge Knight was right after uh, at the period of time when um, this all took place in Vegas, right around that period of time, Suge Knight thought that he had contracts out on his life. So these guys may imagine that it's happening, or maybe they are being told it's happening, or maybe it's true that it's happening. So it's no way to know. Okay, okay. Unless people that are involved in it come forward and say, yeah, I'm the one that placed that bounty on him, and it's true. So. All right. I, I got to rewind it and ask you a, a question. Um, there was the rumor about there being a bounty on a death row chain. Mm -hmm. Now, Keefe D denies it, and also um, other people that were Crips mm -hmm. said they never heard of that. Mm -hmm. But everybody in death row believed there was a bounty on a death row chain. Is there any evidence that there was a, a bounty on the death row chains? There's no evidence that there was an actual bounty. It's not like we have a written contract that somebody produced and go, look at, the, here's, here's the bounty. You know, that this was perceptions. And if death row people believe there's a bounty on their chains and people are trying to steal their chains, which we know happened, then there's a reason to believe that it's true. So it's just a matter of perceptions. Um, there doesn't have to be an actual bounty for people to believe there might be one and then respond or act according to that belief. Right. So right. maybe there wasn't a bounty, but if death row people thought there were a bounty and people are trying to steal their change, then you would form the conclusion that, yeah, there's probably a bounty. Okay, so at one point, um, Orlando actually gets arrested for the Tupac murder. No, he didn't. He never got arrested for the Tupac murder. He was detained to be questioned about uh, the murder of a guy named Elbert Webb. But he made the comment about, hey, is this, um, does this have something to do with Vegas? But they never interrogated him um, regarding the, the uh, Las Vegas shooting. And he was never officially arrested and charged with anything regarding Tupac. Oh, okay. Can you take me through the Orlando murder? Mm hmm Orlando and a um, guy named Little Al, Michael DeRoe, we're in Compton. They see some guys. There's reportedly some type of drug debt that exists, and uh, Orlando goes over there to confront them, to con you know, regarding this drug debt, and it turns into a, a gunfight. Okay. Uh, who all? Who all dies? Michael and Jerry Stone die. Orlando dies, and uh, Michael Dro gets charged with you know, criminal conspiracy to being involved in all of that and ends up uh, under this kind of unique California law, um, gets convicted of all three of the murders. Can you take me through how you got Keith to cooperate? <clears throat> yeah, it's the kind of typical investigative strategy where you get somebody to where um, you have leverage on them. And once you have leverage on them, you introduce the scenario to them and let them make a decision whether or not they think it's in their best interest to cooperate. That's essentially what we did. Built a drug case against him that was going to put him potentially in jail for the rest of his life and said, you know, here's your opportunity to mitigate that situation and tell us the truth about what happened in Tupac's murder or Biggie's murder, whichever you happen to be involved in. And uh, he agreed, his lawyer agreed, and there was a formal agreement between the U.S. Attorney's Office and, and KPD's attorney and sat down and started the process of cooperating and he enlightened us to the details as far as he knew them. It's a very complicated prosecution you know, based on the fact that so much time has passed. You know, we don't get that information until like 2009. Um, a lot of the witnesses and co-conspirators were dead. Uh, Keefe D's a convicted drug dealer, a known gang member, he's perjured himself before, so his own credibility will be in question, and now you're taking his information, and he has immunity in regard to his own confession. And so now we can only go after co-conspirators, all of whom die with the exception of Puffy. Puffy now is, um, you know, an iconic music figure with hundreds of millions of dollars, 
and you're not going to have a very practical likelihood of prosecuting him based solely on the testimony of a known drug gang member, convicted drug dealer, ex-convict, and who has changed his story several times. So the prosecution in Las Vegas realizes that this is, you know, most likely never going to result in a, a conviction. You just don't have the credibility and the witness to bring this forward, and that's the problem with it. Okay. Does anybody know what happened to the gun? No, not for sure. Nobody knows exactly what happened to the gun. What happened, uh, uh, Keefe, did you say they went back? What, or what happened when they went back to the white Cadillac? Keefe D didn't go back to the white Cadillac. He went home by other means. So the white Cadillac and the gun was um, managed or, or handled by the rest of the crew. So Keefe D wouldn't have had any direct knowledge of what happened unless he heard from one of those guys. And he didn't disclose to us what, what happened. Okay. Okay, so I, so I seen you mention um, in, in one of your interviews or one of the, the documentaries, you had said that Tupac found out that Big and Puffy didn't set him up. Do you know how he found that out? I don't know other than talking to people and finding out that, uh, that it was, you know, this other crew having to do with uh, Jimmy Rosemond, James Rosemond. Jimmy Hinchman, um, and then realizing that, okay, yeah, this has something to do with something entirely different, and, uh, you know, kind of back down from that initial response that he thought they'd set him up. Okay, so as far as you know, he actually believed they set him up at first. I think so, yeah. I mean, at least that's, if you listen to some of the words of his, of his songs and some of the statements that he's made, that would have been, I think, uh, a fair interpretation of that. Why was Southside Crips suspects in Biggie's murder? Again, as the, the theory began to be developed that there was money owed as a result of Tupac shooting in Las Vegas and that they were there to collect money and they weren't getting the money that uh, had been agreed upon. This is the theory. And that they retaliated by shooting Biggie because because they weren't collecting. Oh, okay. Can you take me through the Biggie case? Mm -hmm. How everything happened with uh, the story behind, behind solving Biggie's case? Yeah, so after Las Vegas happens, of course, Suge Knight ends up getting his um, probation revoked and goes back to prison. So now he's in jail. Um, you know, six months have gone by since Tupac's shooting. Um, Tupac obviously dies uh, on the 13th, and the rumor starts to go out that what happened in Vegas, maybe Biggie had a hand in it. You know, he provided the gun, he'd hired these Southside Crips, he was in Vegas. It was all erroneous information, but again, this is rumors that happen on the street that people then begin to accept as truth. And so Keefe D and his crew um, are distancing themselves completely from uh, the likes of Puffy Combs because, you know, they all know that they've potentially been in this murder conspiracy together. The feds are breathing down everybody's necks. Law enforcement's all over the place asking questions, so everybody's just trying to lay low. Well, six months goes by, and Puffy and Biggie and all of them come out to Las Vegas, and they're thinking everything's calmed down. Uh, Suge's in jail. Tupac's dead. And they're just trying to, you know, continue... Um, you know, with their music and their, and their promotional stuff. And so they came out here with a false sense of security and uh, they ended up at the Peterson Auto Museum. Unbeknownst to them, Suge Knight is already plotting to retaliate. So he gets a girl that he can trust to act as an intermediary, as a messenger, because he's in jail. She visits him in jail. They have a discussion. He says, this is what I want done. Reach out to this dude who I know will do it. And she does just that. She secures a payment and the three of them conspired to shoot and kill Biggie. The night of the shooting, um, Wardell Faust, the hitman, shows up, lays in wait, and ultimately shoots and kills Biggie. Okay, Poochie, right? Mm -hmm. And um, is there any evidence that anybody else was involved? 
There's no evidence that anybody else is involved other than the three of them. However, um, there's a reasonable um, there's a reasonable idea that maybe there was another person that would have helped to set him up, but we just don't know. We don't have the evidence to support that allegation or claim, but it's likely somebody else was acting as a spotter and helping Pucci get the right guy at the right time. Uh, okay. How much was the payment for Biggie? According to the female that According to the female that acted as the messenger, she mentioned a, a $25,000 agreement. Um, that was also a number that another death row person um, had heard. So that's what we believe to be true. That it was like a $25,000 agreement to get Pucci and the female bought off in order to accomplish what should needed done. Uh, okay, and how'd you get her to cooperate? Same thing we did with Keefe D, just put her in a position where it was in her best interest to cooperate. You know, we were going to charge her with a bunch of counts of perjury, fraud, and take her kids away, put them in foster care, and create just problems for her life um, if she didn't sit down and tell us what we wanted to know. Yeah, I drafted up this fictitious statement that was... Um, well, we introduced it as a statement um, by Ward L. Faust, by Pucci himself, and used it as a ruse kind of to see whether or not she would bite what she did. And so it was just kind of a mind play that we incorporated into the interrogation. Okay, and she, and she uh, opened up right after that? And yeah, she read it, and she said, yeah, what Pucci said was true. So she agreed with what we had written and what we had believed took place. So it confirmed to us that we were on the right track. And then, then she spills, you know, the rest of the story. She fills in the details as to insofar as her involvement and what she did, her conversations with Suge and that type of thing. Oh, okay. And would Suge ever be charged with this? No. How come? Again, goes back to a credibility issue. Uh, Teresa Swan, who's got this long history of perjury, she's got a long history of fraud, and um, you know there's a relationship between them with a kid, and so all of these things, these dynamics come into play when you try to prosecute somebody and take them into court. Um, a good defense witness hired by Suge would eat her alive, just like a good defense um, uh, lawyer for, I'm sorry, a good defense lawyer for Puffy would eat Keefe D alive. You know, so prosecutors understand how these dynamics will play out in court and realize like this would just be a shit show. And so without better evidence, without better witnesses, there's no point in even pursuing it. All right. You know, the reality for both of these cases um, and what I believe is the appropriate responsibility for law enforcement or the response by law enforcement because everybody knows this is the case within law enforcement we all know these are the facts and the details of these cases and just for the sake of history law enforcement both Las Vegas and LAPD should just clear the cases um, if these guys weren't celebrities these would have been cleared long ago these would have been cleared the moment we got the confessions but because of the celebrity status of these and all of the accusations against law enforcement that have taken place over the years, they're very reluctant to take that, that step. But that would be, in my opinion, the right thing to do is just clear these cases um, under mitigating circumstances. You don't have to prosecute people in order to clear cases. What does clear the case mean? Meaning that you come out and you say, for all intent and purpose, these are solved cases, but they're unprosecutable. Even Biggie's the state's lawyer said the same thing. He said, these are not unsolved cases. You know, Perry Sanders himself, who was the representative of the Wallace estate, um, or the lawyer for the Wallace estate, was, th those were his words. These are not unsolved, they're unprosecuted. And I agree wholeheartedly with that statement and that position, and law enforcement ought to come out and go, listen, we know the facts and the details. They're strong. There's compelling evidence to suggest these are the facts, and we're going to clear them. And the other thing about that is that even if they do, if they clear them and somehow information comes in at a future date, 
they can always reopen cases. They can always apply new evidence, new information, and new facts to a case. You know, um, considering the case is solved doesn't preclude you from revisiting them should there be a need to do that. So I think for the sake of uh, these two individuals and their place in history, they should not go down as unsolved murders because they're not. We know what happened conclusively and definitively, and we ought to, uh, that ought to reflect. Is there anything you left out of the book or the documentary that you might have left out for legal reasons or to protect people or anything like that? Yeah, I'm sure there was probably some names that I avoided putting on blast. Um, you know, that book was published nine years ago, and I haven't read it since, so I don't exactly know what I said in there. And the documentary was 2015, so I haven't watched that since that period of time. So I really, I couldn't say for sure um, what I've omitted or should have included at this point. Oh. So you went and uh, talked to Biggie's mom after you solved the case? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What did she think? Well, it was a very emotional thing because I think that at one point she had to come to the realization that her beliefs were wrong and that she pursued and spent a lot of time and energy and money um, pursuing a theory that was ultimately refuted. And so I think that obviously, I think that would cause you to have a, a sense of just uneasiness or regret. It's like, damn, you know, that was a lot of energy and, and, and heartache. Um, and, and then knowing that even though now you know the truth, even though you have the facts and the evidence, no one's gonna do anything about it. Mm. So it's a lose-lose. So I think for her, for Valletta Wallace's sake, um, it, you know, that wound will never heal. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you. Taking oh, the time, man. Pleasure. Yeah. Absolutely. No worries. What's up? This is Cam Capone. We got more content like this coming soon. So hit that like button, subscribe, and stay locked in to Cam Capone News.